Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Simon DeDeo. Simon is assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Social and Decision Science, where he directs the Laboratory for Social Minds. He's also on the external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute. Today's episode is a new format we're calling Currents, where we're going to take an event out in the world that's relatively current, and we're going to have an open-ended conversation from it that will maybe generate its own currents. So uh, I think, and we'll also get it up in a couple of days. So it'll be current as well. So this is current cubed. So the, uh, the item in the, in the news or the current events world we want to talk about is uh, actually something I picked out of Simon's very interesting tweet stream. Always worth following. Follow Simon on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, we'll have a link to his Twitter account on our episode page uh, where he had some reactions to the recent uh, passage by the Oxford Student Union uh, of a quite strong statement kind of upping the ante with respect to uh, you know college student opposition to speech they find I don't know what's the word hateful I think they used in their proclamation hate speech etc uh, so Simon uh, what do you think about this and uh, what does it all mean <laughs> uh, thanks Jim yeah you know this is a uh, phenomenon that is uh, increasingly common. It's something that I think most faculty have noticed in their careers uh, teaching in the last 10 years or so, uh, which is a bit of an inversion um, from the tradition we're usually pretty familiar with, which is students protesting um, against uh, police authority, students protesting against university authority, and in particular, protesting against the constraints of the university or the constraints of the government. The Arsenal Student Union uh, motion that was passed, it was, I think, for somebody who went to university in the 1990s, was, uh, you know, sort of a mirror world. That, that union's motion said, uh, first of all, you know, this is a resolution on hate speech. It's a demand that the university consider censoring, preventing the assignment of uh, philosophical texts that are uh, that would be deemed um, illegal under British law and illegal because they promote uh, denigration or hatred of a protected group. So the, the student union's motion said, A, uh, we think the laws at the governmental level should be stronger, that there should in fact be stricter laws against what one is permitted to say. Um, in the meantime, uh, whether or not those laws are made stricter to prevent a wider range of speech, Oxford University should take the lead uh, in preemptively uh, preventing uh, certain texts from being discussed. Uh, one thing that maybe might strike us particularly is that the texts the students are talking about are not, uh, let's say, Mein Kampf, right? They're not uh, texts that we might consider, um, you know, extraordinarily offensive. In the, the particular case they raised was um, a, a philosophical article about uh, eugenics, and in particular, the question of whether uh, one should selectively, uh, or should select embryos uh, in order to avoid a child with disabilities. So there's a lot of strangeness there, I think, for those of us, um, you know, joining the culture um, from an earlier, an earlier stage of evolution. Yeah, let me uh, let me jump in there a little bit. Uh, you know, I went to college, uh, university, a full generation before you. I showed up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 1971. Oh, uh, all right. <laughs> when we, yeah, the uh, boomers were just giving the finger to the uh, GI Joe generation and the uh, and the silence, and we were basically just grabbing uh, freedom. You know, we were still very much in the shadow of the famous Berkeley free speech movement, mm -hmm. uh, where it was all about what should we be able to say on campus? Anything we want, goddamn well, please. You don't like it? Fuck you, right? Uh, and further, uh, uh, when I talked to people who'd gone to uh, university just a little before me, 
used to be the university acted in loco parentis. You know, they, for instance, couldn't bring your girlfriends up to your dorm room, literally, after 6 o'clock at night. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently, it was true until about 1967, five years before I showed up, four years before I showed up. By the time I got there, hey, if you were uh, clever enough to talk your girlfriend into cohabitating in your dorm room, no one's going to say a word. We even had an account at a local liquor store where we could order hooch and have it delivered to the front desk. So it was all about, you know, maximizing, you know, personal freedom. So again, that uh, that's you know, you know, again from our my generation, even more probably than yours, uh, this kind of you know, the, the people want to legislate a police state. That's very odd. And the other thing I wanted to underline, which uh, I, you know you mentioned in passing, but I think distinguishes this particular act from other you know previous acts, say at, uni at U.S. universities, this was not about censoring an outside speaker you know, uh, or dissuading, uh, reversing an invitation of an outside speaker that people might have thought was, uh, you know, problematic in, the, in that horrible passive-aggressive term used by people on campus these days. Uh, but rather, these were about assigned works by professors in class, uh, you know, and, and they were specifically calling for overruling uh, the British law with respect to academic freedom. So this was an even stronger reach uh, than many of these controversies in the states. It's, you know, this is this is interesting, Jim. And you know, we are we are different generations um, on this. So one of the things that I think we're really used to is, um, as students, uh, you know, one of our main goals is to offend whoever came before, right? So I'm cusp of Gen X millennial. Um, so you know, what I say online is like, okay, boomer, right? So like. We, this, this, um, this battle that we're used to over the course of, of culture, I don't know, post-war culture, who knows when this started, when it became explicit, um, that, that is, um, you know, not, it, it isn't just, oh, the boomers did this and everyone quit. Um, I think it's, uh, it, you know, if that has changed, that's a, that's a much larger shift in, in how the culture works, right? It isn't just, there was a boomer tradition that's now been superseded, uh, but there is a, a, a sort of generational dynamic that, that maybe has shifted. And, you know, part of what I was trying to figure out was, you know, is this really a shift? Because, you know, to put it another way, uh, there's no um, lack of students, uh, young people yelling at the older generation for how they fucked up the world, right? So the, the Oxford resolution was a puzzle to me in a lot of ways um, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's a shift, but if it really is a true shift towards, um, you know, a, a kind of pro-authoritarian stance uh, where the students are, you know, basically inviting the government to intervene at Oxford, um, uh, that's, uh, that's much larger than, you know, one, uh, you know, one generation having different norms from the previous one. It's almost like a, a shift in a meta rule uh, for things. One of the things I wanted to do is, is maybe think a little bit more about this dynamic that we're seeing. You know, there are some standard explanations sitting out there, standard stories sitting out there. You know, one that's become quite popular is, uh, it's been popularized by um, Jonathan Haidt and uh, Greg Lukanov, which is the coddled mind thesis. So this says, you know, look, why, why is this generation um, uh, intervening against uh, or intervening in favor of an authoritarian control in a way that we perhaps haven't seen before, at least in the general student population. Uh, Karl Mein thesis says this generation is unique uh, in that uh, they have been isolated from challenge in life, that they have been protected by uh, parents, helicopter parents, uh, from experiencing any kind of difficulty, shielded from it. Uh, they've been taught to see uh, adversity and unpleasant experiences as damaging as opposed to opportunities for growth. And uh, they've been taught that even the very encountering of an idea that one finds offensive is itself a psychological harm, right? So it's some form of trauma. So that's, that's the coddled mind thesis. I, I don't particularly buy that thesis. You know, I think it's, uh, it's one that resonates with uh, the piece first came on the Atlantic. It resonates with uh, the Atlantic Monthly Readership. Uh, in part because they think the Atlantic Monthly readership is often indeed composed of parents exactly like that. That said, um, I'm not sure that it's representative of the student population, first of all. Stud uh, you know, uh, the racial and sexual diversity of universities has gone up 
under any standard account, uh, the number of students who have actually been exposed to traumatic things has risen as opposed to declined. The students I went to school with, uh, by and large, were, I would say, in some sense, more protected than the ones today. It, 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 it doesn't quite fit that, um, like there's, there's something missing there, right? It, it can neither explain why it's happening, I would say, and it, even if it could, it couldn't explain why now as opposed to before. So there's, I think there's something like missing from that, from that story, at least it's a popular story. Um, so there's a, a, a second thesis, which, uh, you know, different from uh, the Atlantic Monthly Call of Mind thesis. Uh, and that's one, you know, who knows where it came from, one prominent person um, until he disappeared to Russia, uh, was Jordan Peterson, uh, who uh, explains this not as a, you know, a psychological, uh, story about, you know, early childhood and, you know, being forced to wear a bicycle helmet, that kind of thing. Uh, Peterson talks about this moment as an ideological one. So that the students behind uh, these movements uh, are rather motions, right? So the, the, the reason the Oxford Students' Union, uh, you know, called for the banning of certain texts in a classroom is, is not uh, psychological, but rather because they subscribe to a certain ideology and, you know, that what that ideology is. I think Peterson calls it cultural Marxism. Uh, you might call it, uh, I was just reading a, a recent uh, uh, book on this uh, by a left-wing academic who says, well, maybe the right term is postmodern neo-Marxism, who knows. The, the ideological explanation, I think, is also a bit weak. And uh, one reason is, is that no one's really been able to pin down exactly what that ideology is. Like, you know, there is a communist ideology in as much as there was, you know, the Communist Party of the USA, you know, sharing communiques from, from you know, Soviet HQ. It was, uh, you know, this, if this is an ideology, if it's being ideologically driven, it's a really covert, protean, self-contradictory one. And at some point you want to say, well, to what extent is it really an ideology if half of the ideology contradicts the other half or half of what people are saying is there, you know, is it Marxist? Is it postmodern? Is it you know, cultural, economic, materialist, who knows? Um, in some sense, yes, they're banning things because they have ideas and the ideas cause them to ban things because that's usually how, you know, ideas work. But um, I'm, I'm just not buying the thesis that there is a, you know, set of ideas coherent, written down somewhere, or at least, uh, you know, identifiable that all of these uh, motions, uh, protests have in common. So. The ideological thesis, I think, fails just as much as the coddled mind thesis. Well, I, let me uh, you know, respond a little bit to that, the, the yeah, political, yeah. the ideological one. Uh, you know, some of my more thoughtful conservative friends, uh, and I do pride myself on having friends all across the uh, political spectrum, even though that is considered to be unfashionable these days. Oh, uh, I love you, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm such a lovable character. But, uh, oh, are, yeah, yeah. The label they would put on it, you know, again, the most thoughtful of them, they would uh, call this idea, the ideology postmodernist critical theory. So they don't use a you know, seemingly built-in contradictory label like uh, neo-Marxist or cultural Marxism, but they basically uh, focus specifically at critical theory. And uh, there is an identifiable body of work in uh, sociology, anthropology, law, uh, uh, and the humanities uh, that's labeled critical theory. And I, th and I think that uh, is perhaps uh, got a little bit better argument for it. But let's pass on that argument. And let's go on to why I reached out to you and wanted to get you on the show, uh, sure. which, which uh, uh, Simon put forth in his tweet storm and tweet hurricane around the tweet storm, uh, uh -huh. uh, an idea of an alternative explanation uh, that actually is quite interesting called the cocktail tail party model. Uh, why don't you uh, roll that out for us? Well, so Jim, yeah, this is, you know, right, to get a hurricane, I think you need an inversion layer, right? So what I wanted to do is, is take seriously the, the possibility that these motions, protests, and again, we have the, the Oxford Student Union as the, as the example to hand. Um, it's unusual in certain ways. It's unusual, for example, that uh, you know, Britain does not have the free speech laws that we do in the States. Um, it's not as baked in uh, as, as for us. And so, you know, talking about prior restraint by the government in Britain is not, you know, a non-starter as it is in, here in the U.S. But uh, what I wanted to do is think about the possibility that uh, these students are actually taking the university seriously. 
Uh, they're taking a model of education uh, that they've learned, and in particular, I would say they've learned in, uh, in elite circles. Uh, so this is you know, a story about what's happening, let's say, at Oberlin or Amherst, uh, Oxford, Harvard, wherever, uh, as opposed to University of Kentucky, Indiana University, where I used to teach. The, the, you know, the, the Oxonians here are um, taking a model of education that Oxford has been running for 100 years, who knows, maybe all the way back to the foundation of the college of the dictatorial system, uh, has been taking that model and um, literally just taking it seriously. So in some sense, they are actually the most uh, conformist of the students uh, that we have to hand. And they're, in some sense, revealing the contradictions of a certain story about what it means to, to learn. So uh, that model, I call it the cocktail party model. Uh, the cocktail party model of education, uh, if you spent time in uh, a place like Oxford, so that would exclude, for example, uh, your education gym at MIT. Uh, but so not like a tech school model, not an engineering school model, uh, not the Moscow State model, but the uh, elite Anglosphere, you know, uh, Ivy Color buildings model. This is a story about what you do when you go to seminar. So the primary place you learn is, at least according to this model, not in a lecture hall, not in a top-down um, you know, communication model, not in the uh, you know, Yoda um, guru model. Uh, this is a model of education where you, you come into a room, you sit around a table, and you talk. And that's an insufficient level of definition, right? The way I understood the Oxford seminar model, and I keep saying Oxford is just because we happen to have the OSC to hand, um, is uh, an ethic of hospitality, meaning what it means to be in seminar is understood roughly along the lines of what it means to go to a cocktail party. So uh, you're learning the rules, the, the, the boundaries, the guardrails here uh, for what is right behavior, what's wrong behavior, what it means to do well, what it means to do poorly. Um, those, uh, those norms are uh, imported in part from uh, the drawing room. I don't know, maybe the 18th century, 19th century drawing room. So what does this mean, right? Uh, it means, for example, when you go to the seminar, the professor is the host. The students are the guests. I don't know what your dinner parties are like, Jim, but you know, when I throw a dinner party, the host has certain obligations, right? Uh, you're, not a, you're not a dictator. At a dinner party, the host is not telling people what to do. They create an environment in which the guests can enjoy themselves in a certain structured way. The guests themselves have reciprocal obligations. The, uh, the host is you know, some kind of partly like a Socratic midwife. They're trying to draw the guests out. The guests talk amongst themselves. The host's interventions are minimal. Uh, the ideal uh, interactions are ones of enlightened, dynamic conversation. Having experienced this myself, in some sense, this is something you have to learn. Uh, you're taught if you go to like a certain fancy kind of uh, high school, you learn it uh, when you're 13, 14. If you come to an elite university from a, a more demotic background, you learn it um, you know, sort of on the job. Often freshman year, you'll have a seminar that kind of teaches you the law of seminar without explicitly teaching you the law of seminar. So uh, that's the cocktail party model. It's a bit, uh, you know, if I were to give you a taxonomy and a list of rules, it'd be a bit tricky. Uh, one way I thought about it was, um, you know, many of our educational practices or our theories of what it means to learn go all the way back to Plato. Um, the part of Plato that teaches us the cocktail party model is probably the opening first half of Plato's Symposium, which is a dinner party that uh, in many ways is a model for the optimal seminar, the optimal tutorial. What happens, uh, people come, they're pretty orderly. They drink, but not too much. You probably don't drink anymore um, at the seminar table, but certainly, you know, an elite university will have cocktail hour at some point, you drink sharing. You don't get roaring drunk, but there's a conviviality to it. You go around the table, you share your ideas. Uh, people respect each other, even when they disagree. Um, there's, you know, Socrates in this case is the special guest. He's gonna show up, ruin everything. That's the second half of the symposium. But uh, that first half, uh, when I read it recently, I thought, Christ, like, that's what I was taught to do. So if we take that cocktail party model and say, 
uh, all right, that's what we were doing in, let's say, you know, Cambridge or Oxford in 1980 or 1990 or even 2000. Uh, what happens when we bring, when we open the university up, right? The cocktail party, and by calling it the cocktail party, I want to draw attention to the idea that this is a bit of a frou-frou fussy event, right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's this, kind of a white, kind of a white people thing, right? It's, yeah, it's like, remember that website stuff white people like, like stuff white yeah, people like exactly. Amherst Art History Seminar, like that's awesome, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so, right, so, you know, and like, you know, your Patagonia jacket, your, your L.L. Bean backpack, that's at least maybe you can say from the symposium that has devolved over the next whatever 2500 years into um a uh sort of refined decorous way to talk now it's not entirely decorous people disagree but just as a good dinner party has an argument right uh has a drama to it so can the cocktail party uh but at some point you know these students are sitting there and they're saying look i read john stuart mill i'm a good enlightened liberal um, you know, race doesn't matter, gender doesn't matter, disability doesn't matter. Uh, everybody is at the cocktail party now. And you now encounter really serious tension because one of the basic rules of the cocktail party is you know, don't, don't be offensive, right? You can gossip about people who aren't there. You know, it's a bit tacky, but you can do it. It's sufficiently elevated. But, um, you know, cocktail party model says um, you shouldn't make, let's say, personal remarks about the seminar leader. Right. You can't be like, you know, it's really interesting. We're reading, you know, reading Plato on, on, you know, uh, on, uh, you know, erotic love between the young and the old. And I, I'm going to notice, you know, prof, your, your wife is really young. That's a rude moment. That's like off, that's off limits. Right. Now, Hey, you might say, well, shit, like that's just, you know, that's rough and tumble. Let's learn, man. Right. You, you, you're some kind of wimp. You can't handle that. That's just, out, it's outside the bounds. Right. You, if you do that, you're no longer doing cocktail party. You might be doing something else. My guess is that, you do that at, you know, whatever, Amherst, you're, you're done, right? Um, you're not going to get a good black letter at the very least. You're not going to get invited back. You might get in fun. So let's take the Oxford Student Union example, which uh, they suggested a text that, that might be banned, is uh, this text, I would say it's the eugenicist text. I don't like it. I don't, I don't agree with it, but you know, we can talk about that later. There's, this is a text that says basically, should we... Uh, abort babies who will turn out to be disabled, let's say, in a wheelchair. You can't have that conversation. That's a really awkward conversation to have in the cocktail party model if somebody in the seminar room is in a wheelchair. It's just rude, right? I'm not saying it can't be discussed. Um, I'm just saying it can't be discussed in that model. Um, we need some, you know, if you wanted to do that, I would say the cocktail party model is broken. Um, we didn't notice this, I think, um, Maybe we did. I'm sure people did. Well, people noticed this, right? Uh, it's just on Twitter. But, um, you know, if the seminar was all male, like, you know, an Oxford seminar on the Odyssey in you know, the 19th century, uh, you could say all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, the men around that table could say all sorts of stuff that if there are women in the room, they would feel embarrassed to say, right? They wouldn't be able to say it because it would, that's just not decorous in that environment. So let's just take that, let's just say this, right? What if the, the speech codes, the protests, these sorts of things are not actually a secret radical cell of, you know, the Foucault International. Uh, what if this is actually the best students and all they're doing is saying, look, we're, we're, we're trying to square a story about how to learn that you've taught us, you taught us to idolize, um, with another thing you taught us to idolize, which is, you know, sort of a, let's say, liberal humanism. And there's some clash there. So that's a different way to understand why ban this text, um, not because um, you know, the person in the wheelchair has led a coddled and easy life, that's the high theory, that's bullshit, excuse me, at that point. Uh, not because um, I have subscribed to a, a, you know, a really extensive theory about disability and you know, consciousness or whatever, uh, but simply because this just doesn't feel like, it kind of, kind of ruins the party. Yeah, I'll call it the hospitality filter. Right, exactly. uh, you know, it's inhospitable. Yeah, it's it's yeah. not it's not hos, uh, it, In fact, that it ties back to the uh, in in a, in some kind of uh, almost uh, linguistic way to the idea of a hostile environment. It's not hospitable, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, and, you know, uh, yeah, that that's, that's Jim, actually an interesting that. idea. And so, essentially, what you're saying is uh, that these students are taking the 
uh, traditions of hospitality and the cocktail mar party, or maybe even the dinner party might actually be a little closer. But yeah, but some form of high hospitality as a true norm. And they're saying that if you have to, if you now assume that we're going to include a much broader group of people, our definition of hospitality has to change. Yes, I, that's that's great, Jim. I like this. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, one question is, is do we want the ethic of hospitality to be the thing beneath an educational experience, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, now, now it may be that it, that, uh, it breaks under that. It may put too many constraints. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, and, and I suspect we are under the influence to a degree of some uh, – postmodernist theory here because uh, you know I don't imagine uh, anyone's going to call the police on my dinner party because I violated some rule of hospitality right uh, so we are there you know the, the idea of making this a uh, general will kind of uh, you know legally enforced doctrine is is beyond hospitality by a long shot so there is some ideology there uh, but maybe uh, rather than uh, at one level I like uh, the fact that you floated this idea because it explains actually a lot. It also explains, as you mentioned in a tweet storm, uh, that this is typically a phenomena of elite universities. And as you said, not, uh, you know, Eastern Kentucky or Prince George's County Community College or any of those places that, that we know and love, actually. Uh, but it's, it, it's of the elite. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, if you think about this, there are other alternatives. Uh, you know, you mentioned at MIT where I went, uh, you don't have this cocktail party uh, ethos at all. Uh, you know, it's uh, a battle of the uh, battle of the wills and the wits, and let the fastest win, right, Pierre? Let the chips fall where they may. Uh, I think I also mentioned when I was chatting to you once. Uh, company I was on the board of. All the software engineers, I think 17 of them, 22 of them, I don't know how many of them. Every one of them was a physicist from Moscow, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I think about 90% 90, 90 of them were of Jewish ethnic background. And these guys, they love to just get down to it, right? Uh, it was, you know, they would be cursing each other's mothers and their ancestries and uh, in an argument about some technical issue, right? Uh, and at the end of it, though, they were all slapping each other's backs and going outside and smoking some deadly cigarettes. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a, another model that, that is actually better. And, you know, truthfully, at SFI, you and I both have had, spent a lot of time at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, there's an awful lot of intellectual sword fighting there as well, and probably not a whole lot of, uh, of the hospitality model. Uh, maybe the hospitality model has, uh, is no longer functional when you have to accommodate some vast array of people and their potential uh, sensitivities. It's great, Jim. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> let's say, I don't, maybe this is like too critical theory postmodern for you, Jim, right? But like, you know, I, I love SFI. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, when someone whips their sword out of their pants, it's always the greatest conversation, right? So, I mean, there is, um, you know, there, we have other models, right? So, like, if I were, if I were going to do the same cultural theory move on, on, on uh, the Moscow State model, right? Um, you know, this is, this is the military barracks model. Right. This is, you know, we we're going to solve problems um, uh, through a uh, a model of, you know, fair fighting, let's say um, you can you can toss a bunch of insults. I mean, there are always you know, there's always boundaries and rules here. You know, maybe the rule in Moscow State is like, don't cry. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure that, you know, I, I don't think you're saying this, Jim, but, you know, to be clear. Right. Um, there's no way outside of a culture, right? There's, there's no way to have the view from nowhere seminar, right? You, you, there are a set of norms that, that sort of guide what, you know, what are the, you know, the optimal or correct things to do, what it means to succeed, what it means to have a good throw down fight in, you know, in the, you know, in the cafeteria. One of my, uh, uh, Twitter friends, we knew each other from the Turing Institute back in London. Uh, he's, he's now at NYU. He's Josh, uh, Josh, um, you know, he's quite upfront about the fact that he, you know, made it in academia without an elite background, working class family. He's talked really eloquently about that. Uh, Josh, like, you know, and I think I'm attributing this correctly to Josh, and maybe some have commented on it, so I would be careful. Uh, but the, uh, let's talk about, like, the, the boxing ring metaphor, right? Uh, the, the sparring match metaphor. Another one is uh, the uh, uh, college debate metaphor. I never liked college debate, Jim. I never made quite made sense to me, but... Um, you know, college debate metaphor, there are, there are rules here to debate, they're very different, right? They're not rules, for example, of insight, I would say, or even necessarily learning, 
Uh, you can learn from watching a debate, but the participants, in some sense, you win in a debate if you learn the least, right? If your position changes the least over the course of it. So, uh, you know, if we think, okay, like maybe you maybe we've, you've, you bought this gym, which is great, I'm thrilled. Maybe you bought that, okay, this is the explanation about why um, we are having this rather unusual moment where um, students are, you know, protesting in favor of greater restriction on what's happening. Then we say, okay, well, then what's next, right? Do we have other models for how people can talk to each other uh, in an open way, in a way that they learn, uh, in a way that they develop their, let's say, dialectical abilities, meaning their abilities to, to talk to each other, develop their ideas over the course of time? Um, that's a great question. That's a really, it's a really fun question. Um, an important question, right? If uh, elite universities are molding the minds of the leaders of the future, uh, then we need to make sure we're picking a metaphor. And of course, these are all metaphors, you know, a cocktail party, uh, a boxing ring, they're all metaphors. We don't actually, we're not actually enacting these things. And so it's important. It's got high stakes. Uh, and, you know, when, when I, you know, I guess when I said I bought your model, uh, I, you know, I think it's up a fairly reasonable explanation that fits the facts as well or better than any of the alternatives. But it doesn't mean I agree with the outcome by any means, right? <laughs> I, uh, I was like, fuck, you know, kids calling the cops on their professors for including a philosophy paper in the class? That's fucking nuts, right? Uh, and so uh, I can see where we got to via your analysis, but personally, uh, and, and maybe it's just Hey, oh, it's just okay, boomer time here. Uh, it's just you know something. I'm I think just uh, I, I I'd be damn pissed off if my kids uh, were paying three hundred thousand dollars to get educated like that. Uh, you know, in, a, a different alternative, equally serious, uh, maybe more serious, is University of Chicago. Right? You can't sure. get any more formal, serious about the intellectual content, and yet with uh, and very, very polite forms of discourse, uh, they have their own whole style of doing seminars, and yet rigorous, open, free speech. Uh, maybe that's a better alternative. I mean, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's raise the stakes a little bit, Jim, right? I mean, um, you know, you mentioned your, your um, you know, your chain-smoking, you know, Moscow physicists were Jewish. Um, Chicago, I mean, to me, it always seemed to be MIT for the humanities um, in the sense that there was, when I was there, I was a postdoc there for a while, and looking at how undergraduates dealt with that, the world they were in was very different from, let's say, Harvard uh, or Cambridge. And I wonder if that's in part, uh, UChicago, you know, had less of the, let's just say it, like the kind of Episcopalian anti-Semitism that I've always kind of associated with um, the Harvard model, right? Uh, and the British model more generally, that, uh, you know, certain ways of talking uh, were like just a little too Jewish. And I'm reminded, Jim, I don't know if you remember this, the great scene in Annie Hall, where Woody Allen's character goes to Annie Hall's house, right? And it's like this very, you know, kind of waspy, like, oh, you know, Jim was at the boat basin today. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I really scrubbed some boats for a while. And then they have the split screen with, uh, you know, uh, Woody Allen's, uh, Albie, I guess the name of the character, uh, Alvi's uh, Brooklyn family and they're yelling over each other and it's like it's crass from the point of view of the Episcopalian uh, model but it's also it's a lot more fun. It's authentic uh, right it's all you know it's an authentic cultural way right. Well what is authenticity I mean, this, I mean we're really getting down to it Jim right you know what is authenticity. Um, yeah, I, guess I, just, I guess having to pull up your ass and your nose and your nose on the air is authentic right if that's who you are. <laughs> well I mean you know what is like I mean I don't know, Jim. I mean, obviously, elite universities do a couple things, right? They transmit knowledge. They're, they're sources of innovation. Uh, in the U.S., uh, the elite universities are, yeah, sources of innovation. But you know what? Like, a lot of state universities are as well. You can win a Nobel Prize uh, if you go to Michigan State. It's really hard to get a job at Merrill Lynch, right? You're going to be in the back room for many, many years if you come out of Michigan State. So, um, you know, what is, what's Oxford meant to be doing, right? I mean, other than what Indiana is doing, which is like, let's read some books and learn some stuff, right? Uh, let's discover some new facts about the universe and new ways to see it. You know, one of the reasons people send their kids to Harvard is uh, so that they act like kids that went to Harvard. And so, you know, I hate to say it, Jim, one of the reasons people pay a lot of, and this is obvious, one of the reasons people pay a lot of money to go to Harvard is because it puts you, it, it gives you the right social polish. Um, 
it, it, you are, you're good at cocktail parties. Uh, I think Harvard would change pretty quickly if, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the way you got a job at Merrill Lynch was acting like you're in a, in a, in a, you know, uh, working class Brooklyn, you know, uh, you know, dinner party. I think it would change. Maybe see a little bit. I, I haven't actually seen how seminars run at Stanford. It's pretty clear that Stanford is um, the new model uh, for elite education. Um, you know, Harvard is starting to look like, uh, you know, Disneyland West for the Anglosphere. Like, what is, what is the next thing? Physics is an easy one, right? Because it's, I mean, I hate to say it, and now I sound like Jordan Peterson, right? it's kind of right or wrong, right? Like, you divided by zero, you didn't, right? The bridge fell down or it didn't. That's not the only kind of knowledge, right? Other kinds of knowledge are more discursive. They're, uh, they're more reflective. They require you to situate yourself in that classroom as a person with a past. That's very different. You know, you go to, you go to physics, you go to class in physics, it doesn't really matter how the electron makes you feel, right? But, you know, it actually does matter how, um, you know, Aristotle makes you feel. Not because your feelings are really important, but because Aristotle is trying to affect how you feel, right? Uh, a, you know, a, a physics class doesn't really, you know, you can learn physics without having, you know, profound feelings about the nature of the space-time manifold. Uh, or rather, we can have a diversity of feelings about the space-time manifold. I was going to say, what about sacrilege, right? <laughs> I know, right, right. Well, the doesn't believe in it, right? It's terrible. It's a horrible thing. Uh, but, yeah, so, you know, if you want to teach Aristotle, um, you have to have some some way of dealing with the fact that Aristotle is trying to change you as a person, that Balzac is trying to take, change you as a person, or like Foucault is trying to change you as a person, perhaps how you read a text or how you see the world around you. So, you know, we, I, we, we can't get rid of discussion at all, right? No, we, um, we, nor, you know, certainly not in the humanities and the social sciences. It would be absurd. Well, exactly. And I mean, you know, let's go all the way back. I mean, you know, look, as a, you know, fundamentalist uh, for the Platonic tradition, right? Maybe we go back and we look, what are the other models sitting there in the dialogues, for example? What are the other ways that people think about it? Uh, here's one that you can't do, right, which is the Phaedrus, right, which is Socrates shows up and flirts with a young guy, right? Uh, although Oxford does do that as well. I, a friend of mine once said, uh, the benefits of being a classist professor at Oxford uh, include a great library and a little light pederasty. Um, so, but, you know, Phaedrus out, good reason, done, right, can't do that. Okay, symposium you know, it doesn't work, it, it kind of, it, it's, you know, for these very reasons, it, it conflicts with a certain kind of thing that showed up and John Stewart knows who, who you want to blame for it. I don't know, maybe we all download to the matrix, right, and we take on the identity we want, and yet that still doesn't work, Jim, right, because we are, we are sitting here as people, right, sitting here as people with past. If you don't understand Aristotle from the point of view of a person with a past, you don't understand them. I don't know, I'm racking my brain, what else we have in the, I mean, I don't know, we have the Parmenides. Parmenides is like an old guy, you know, surrounded by people who basically are asking him to demonstrate things. We have the Mino. Okay, we can't do the Mino. The Mino involves like enslaving someone. That's out. So I don't know. Maybe, you know, Jim, like, I guess what you're, you know, what you're saying is um, we should really fund more cultural theory of education. That's, that's your, <laughs> uh, that's your, your radical left-wing position at the end of it is uh, maybe we're, we actually, you know, instead of uh, fighting something, we should realize that it's, it's telling us that there's maybe a paradox sitting in there that uh, the students have revealed uh, to us. The, uh, they've revealed it to us, I think, in part, um, like a place like Oxford, um, by opening up to working class students, by opening up to uh, non-white students, by opening up to women. I mean, it took them ages, right? Um, Oxford is, is, that's one tension that's revealed. Uh, in the U.S., um, enormous numbers of East Asian students now, not just coming to the U.S. To, to do machine learning, but also to, you know, acquire a liberal education. I think we, we should expect to see these tensions. Uh, we should expect them to have unusual outcomes. And, um, you know, maybe the, the following from that is that we should expect that new ideas, new uh, cultural practices around education those are the things we should be looking for. How do you run a seminar differently? It's a first mover problem as well. So, you know, if you're, let's say, a striving university that's not as good as Harvard, right? Just, I don't know, pick it out of a hat like Yale. Um, you know, say you wanted to, say you're Yale, you want to change the seminar. Well, you can't because if you don't do the Anglosphere model, then you don't, you're not elite anymore. 
And now who's going to pay, you know, five times the price to go there? So there's an imagination problem, maybe. There's also the fact that, look, people go to universities to look like a university man, as they used to say. Um, so even if we do have better ideas, it could be very hard to get um, the universities, the faculty on board, and, um, you know, dare I say it, in the paying customers, the parents and the, the loan officers on board as well. Well, I think we'll, uh, why don't we wrap it up there? I think this has been a very interesting excursion. Uh, you know, to recap it, I'll give you a chance to respond to the recap. We, we see this, what seems to us, old farts, me a real old fart, and Simon a very junior old fart, as uh, uh, somewhat anomalous to what we would expect from college students. But uh, as Simon thinks about it a little bit, he comes up with this hospitality-based cocktail mar party model. Uh, which actually does seem to fit the traditions of the seminar room at the in the in the elite Anglosphere uh, when you cross it with uh, radical diversity, and because it leads to conclusions at least I would object to, uh, and I think Simon sort of objects to. At least There's something odd about it, Jim. Let's just say yeah. that you know. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I would say it's, it's problematic. Let's yeah. say it's problematic. Yeah, that's a good word. I, I usually hate that word using the passive aggressive. Yeah. But in this case, I think it actually fits. It's problematic. And so, therefore, that highlights your final uh, riff, which is what this ought to be seen as, as a flag uh, that the whole concept of uh, how the seminar is conducted in elite universities needs to be rethought. Yeah. Or, you know, Jim, we could just go back to all male, all white universities. That would solve it, right? How I mean, that's boring. <laughs> I, well, well, exactly, right? I mean, yeah. it's, um, you know, I, a college I know and love, I was, I've been educated there partly myself, uh, is St. John's College in Santa Fe. Um, and I would go down there in the summers. Um, their tutorial system is insane. It's insanely good. Um, and yet, there, their attentions. Um, St. John's really gets into your head, right? Uh, you read some really intense texts. I mean, you read texts about rape and murder, right? You read the Greek tragedy. As, you know, going in at 38, that's fine. You know, we're all adults around the table. We have a better sense of things. Uh, you put a 17-year-old guy and a 17-year-old young woman in that, in the seminar room and have a discussion about that text. Something's going to go wrong, right? Um, uh, oh, well, yeah. It's, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's this is where height might have something, right? Uh, go Here's what I mean by this, Jim. Something's going to go wrong in the sense that either somebody's going to say something really offensive. And I, I, by offensive, I mean cocktail party model violated. Right, right. right. Um, you know, um, or they're going to self-censor. Um, they're going to self-censor um, because uh, the emotions, the, the backgrounds the students bring in, uh, one is a man, one is a woman, talking about something, they're pretty immature, all 17 year olds are throughout time. Um, it's in the dialogue. So, you know, they're, they're, they're going to read about, let's say, a rape, and uh, they're going to want to talk about this, but I just don't think that, that a mixed sex group has the capacity to talk about that under the cocktail party metaphor or under the cocktail party model. There's a gap there. And, um, you know, how the faculty, when I was there, you know, one of the things that I had a sense of was that students would actually in discussions after class, for example, would segregate by sex, talk these things over. So in a funny way, actually, they were kind of reconstituting a cocktail party where some of these offensive ideas could be discussed in single-sex groups. That's kind of nuts. And I, this was women as well as men. Um, so, you know, if St. John's is the ultimate, you know, like, you know, Bible college, except the Bible is the dialogues, not the Hebrew Bible, um, you could see them actually sort of trying to, you know, go backwards in time to make it work. Uh, so it's it's a it's a really I don't know Jim it's a really fun puzzle for for what for what we do next. Um, some, some friends of mine would call the liminal moment where we don't quite know uh, we know there's an issue but we don't know what the solution is and that's kind of fun. I, I think that's right. It's um, you know whenever there's a you know I mean like Hegel right thesis antithesis synthesis there you know the John Stuart Mill, and I'm using that as a kind of metonym for uh, a certain kind of egalitarian liberalism that, you know, we, we see on Star Trek. You know, the, the bridge of this, you know, Starship Enterprise is a fantasy, an imaginary that I would say arose in part out of a cocktail party conversation that, you know, a bunch of guys had in, in a seminar room. Uh, what they didn't know, perhaps, was that they were developing an idea that one day would blow up that very room that they were creating that idea in. And that is always very exciting. Um, 
maybe that's why, Jim, I think I'm a little resistant to these kind of reductive explanations that say, ah, it's a bunch of brats or, ah, it's a bunch of, you know, uh, sleeper agents. You know, that maybe this is something that's really very interesting uh, for us. Uh, our attention, your attention, my attention is drawn to it because there seems to be something off here. Self-censorship seems to be wrong. Maybe what we're realizing is that whether or not any model requires censorship, I would say secretly it does, right? There are things you can't say at Moscow State. Well, literally there were, but even like the, whatever the Brooklyn version of Moscow State was, there are things you can't say there either. You know, maybe it's just this censorship regime that requires the cocktail, that is required by the cocktail party model. Maybe that regime is, um, is coming to an end. It's, it's, it's gotten too much and we need to move on. I mean, Jim, I've gone on, I've gone on lots and lots, but this is, I don't know, Jim, I love this. This is very helpful. Yeah, this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you, uh, Simon, for uh, another excellent talk on the Jim Rudd Show. Wonderful. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.